Bobbish. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about what a computer game taught me about software development. The, the game, it was already uh, announced before, is Factorio. So Factorio is a game that tickles all the right brain cells of a software developer. It has simple ingredients, high complexity, lots of potential for optimization, and the game is powerful enough that you can actually build a proper CPU in it. But the more surprising part I found is that this game is not only captivating to play, but you can also learn a lot from, uh, from playing it about software architecture. And by the way, when I say captivating, I really mean addictive. So you may spend hundreds of hours playing it, don't say I haven't warned you. <laughs> but before we dive deeper into this, let's have a very quick introduction to what Factorio is about. So, like any good game, or at least games that I enjoy, the story, the background story is actually very short and becomes irrelevant very soon uh, as it's replaced by game mechanics. So we're stranded on a foreign planet with nothing but an axe. And our objective is to build a spaceship in order to get home. Now, building a spaceship from scratch is a pretty hard task, so we can't get at it, uh, at it right away, we need to automate things on the way. Most of the time, we're not building rockets or rocket parts, but machines that produce rocket parts, machines that produce machines, machines that produce parts for machines, etc. And let's be honest, why stop there? Building a spaceship is only the beginning, and Factorio allows us to just continue playing. So, as we build our second spaceship, we find bottlenecks in our construction uh, cycle, in our production cycle. We eliminate these bottlenecks, we find the next bottlenecks, and so on. And soon, we're not struggling to build our second spaceship, but we're looking how many spaceships per minute can we build. So, why am I giving this talk? Uh, in March 2020, during the lockdown with nowhere to go, to, uh, go outside, uh, I had a lot of time at hand and I started another game of Factorial. And I spent about 150 hours of play time over the course of two months. Uh, and while playing, I was also reading up resources online, discussing Factorial architecture with a friend. And over time, I started to realize that a lot of the discussions we had and a lot of the patterns we either read up on or we discovered actually have pretty strong analogies in software development and software architecture. And at the same time, I, in my job, I was with a client, a corporate startup, which was growing from two teams and a total of 10 developers to more than 20 teams and more than 100 developers over the course of two years. Uh, yeah. And of course, with that growth comes all kinds of challenges. Uh, scaling architecture, investing in automation, rearranging teams, dealing with legacy code, dealing with operations, you name it. But even fast-changing software projects change on a time scale that seems pretty static. And it takes a long time to really observe the effect of any larger organizational or architectural change. The beauty of this analogy is that in a computer game, everything moves a lot faster, so the feedback for any change comes a lot, of any change comes a lot quicker. Basically, we can condense the evolution of a multi-year software project down to just a few weeks of gameplay. And this brings me to the main point. This time-lapse view actually allows us to learn something. But before we dive into this, let's have a very quickly look at the main game mechanics. This is by no means complete, and I'm not going to show you the full tech tree. Um, but it's 
Okay, basically the bare minimum, so you have a chance to understand what I'm what I'm going to be talking about. In Factorio, you have resources that you are going to turn into intermediate products and actual production items until at some point you, uh, you arrive at rocket parts to build the actual rocket. One example of a resource is iron ore, which is mined from the planet surface and then turned into iron plates in a machine called a furnace and it consumes a fuel uh, in order to, uh, to melt it, uh, for example, coal. Iron plates then can further be processed into steel plates, again in a furnace. Other examples for, uh, for resources are copper ore, stone, water, crude oil, so everything you can mine from the planet surface itself. Then we have the intermediate products. Uh, one prime example being electronic circuits, which are created from copper wire and iron plates. And uh, they are created in a factory called an assembly machine. Copper wire, of course, is made from copper plates, and copper plates in turn are made from copper ore. Um, and then there's an advanced version of circuits, those red circuits, uh, which in turn takes green circuits to produce. So that, that way you have this uh, dependency tree of resources to, uh, to construct more and more complex ones. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. So there are lots and lots of other intermediate products that we're not going into here. It's important to note that everything in Factorio is produced from those resources. So, for example, furnaces themselves are made from stones and they are created in a machine called an assembling machine. Even assembling machines themselves are produced in an assembling machine. Next to production, the other important part, the other important ingredient in Factorio is logistics. There are different tiers of logistics, the most basic one being belts, inserters and chests. Belts are great for moving things over short to medium distances, and inserters are kind of like the adapters to the belt network. In order to feed items to a machine, uh, we use inserters to pick it up from the belt, place it into the machine, and then also the uh, resulting products are placed back on the belt using an inserter. The second logistics tier are logistic robots. These robots can pick up items from a chest, move them to another chest where they are needed, so they are dispatched automatically. Logistics robots are very, very flexible, uh, as they can transport anything from anywhere to anywhere, uh, and let, uh, as long as it's covered by the robot network. Um, and unlike belts, which need to be routed properly, so for belts you first need to route the belt and then it will transport one thing from A to B, whereas robots can, can just dispatch them wherever they're needed. But uh, robots have very low capacity. In addition to logistic robots, there are also construction robots that can construct buildings. These allow us to automate construction of new buildings rather than placing every single building by hand. We can just add a placeholder for one or multiple buildings and the robots will build, uh, will build them. Last in our logistics stack are railways. Those train wagons have very high capacity, but they need some time to load and unload. So trains are best for moving huge amounts of uh, identical items over large distances. And the last thing to mention is how the tech tree is discovered. So you've seen the tech tree before, I'm not going to show it again. Um, and the details, uh, for, for this talk, the details don't really matter. But just uh, for, for your understanding, so the, um, in order to unlock new products or technologies, we need to do research. This is done by producing those science packs. So you have automation science uh, packs, logistic science packs, and so on. They are produced from other intermediate products and uh, then consumed in a science lab in order to research, uh, research new technologies. So 
next to producing everything that goes into rocket parts, also producing things for research for, for those science packs is an integral part of the game. So now we have basically the, the, the rough, uh, rough overview of the game mechanics. Let's start with a new factorial game from scratch. In the beginning, we have basically nothing but an axe, and we can use that axe to mine the very first resources by hand. A few bits of coal, a few bits of ore, a few bits of stone. Soon, we can use those stones in order to build a furnace, to melt some iron, and that allows us to build the very first bits of actual infrastructure. Drills for mining, chests for storage, and circulars for connecting these to our furnace. But things really take off when we start using inserters and belts to wire up things. Previously, we needed to run from one resource patch to the other, for example, to carry coal to furnaces. Uh, now we can connect them with our belts and transport the resources from where they are mined to where they are consumed. But if we do that naively, then, so if we just run a belt uh, wherever we happen to need a resource, it soon turns into a big mess. So this is the point where we actually need to think about architecture. How do we properly design a base that we don't end up in a big mess? Here's a, here's a few things we need. We need to funnel all the resources in a way that belts are not all over the place, but somehow ordered. We want to be able to add new types of factories as we explore the tech tree. And we also want to be able to scale existing factories uh, as we need more production capacity. And luckily, we don't have to figure this out from scratch. By now, there's a collection of standard architectural patterns for factorial bases that are ready to be used. This specific pattern here is called the bus, similar to a bus on a main board. You have the resources flowing north to south, factory clusters branching away east and west, uh, taking the required resources from the belt and feeding the, the resulting products back into the belt. We can scale vertically by adding new factories at the end of the belt as we explore the tech tree and we can scale horizontally, growing the clusters to the side as we need more capacity. And this, to a certain extent, this is kind of like the object-oriented monolith of factorial bases. Everything is in one place, everything is well-ordered and well-connected. You have a clear separation of concerns. And the pattern is actually pretty good. It's very compact, not wasting much space, and it's quite scalable, so it gets you a long way. Now, what can we learn about software development here? First of all, the power of architectural patterns. When starting on the green field in a software project, things look very easy in the beginning and turn messy really quick having an understanding of architectural patterns, and more importantly, a clear decision and a clear consensus which approach to follow is vital. So it's not so much about choosing the very best pattern, the, best, the very best architecture, because at some point it will be legacy code anyway. The important part is to have a structure and to stick to it. And in the beginning, the structure can be very well monolithic. With a team of three people, you don't want to build 50 microservices. You'll be more caught up in context switches than producing actual working software. And a similar argument goes for Git repositories. At the beginning, a monorepository is probably a very good idea. It fosters collaboration and it keeps things cohesive. So yeah, and if you need, you still can change it later. So let's leave the bird's eye view for a moment and zoom in. 
As you've probably noticed from the overall screenshot, these factories are quite repetitive. There actually goes quite some work into optimizing those little units, getting, for example, the ratios right, the, the ratio between uh, three copper wire factories and two, um, uh, and two uh, electronic circuit factories. So they depend on production time for each item, but also on the amount of resources that are, uh, uh, are needed in order to produce something. And we also, we want to gulp down space consumption so that the factories are not taking up a, a huge, huge patches of space. At the beginning of the game, we construct every single building manually. But over time, of course, this becomes very tedious, especially as clusters become more complex. For example, this cluster producing uh, advanced circuits is a lot more complex than the five buildings for the green factory, uh, for the green uh, chips. So it's time to think of automation. Factorio allows us to create blueprints. Uh, blueprints of a group of buildings. So we can design our circuits factory, our circuits factory group once, and then duplicate, uh, duplicate it over and over again. In fact, we don't even need to design it ourselves. There are websites where we can search for factorial blueprints and just use them in our game. Then construction robots come into play. They will carry the necessary resources to the building site and create the buildings according to the blueprint. For creating buildings manually, we need it to be somewhere in the vicinity of the building site in order to place the building. With construction robots, the building site only needs to be covered by the, by the network. So, unfortunately, I didn't manage to get video footage here, but you can see those little dots here. These are robots that are flying all over the place in order, to, uh, in order to construct those buildings. So, what are the lessons that we can learn here? Actually, I have two lessons. The, the first one being uh, automate everything. Whenever we encounter a repetitive manual task, we should think about automating it. Build scripts, CICD pipelines, deployment, you name it. The benefit is not only that it saves us work. In fact, sometimes automating things is even more work. The real benefit is that we don't need to remember the details anymore. For example, if I'm the only person who knows how to deploy, uh, deploy a, a particular service, and I'm on vacation, then, well, tough luck. Uh, but if deployment is just an automated step in an automated pipeline, then I can enjoy my holiday. And similar, I don't need to remember all those factories here, how to exactly place them, how, where exactly the inserter should go. That's just automation. <coughs> the second lesson, can learn from Factorio here is the power of templates. There are some repetitive tasks that are either impossible to automate or just not worth the effort. In these cases, templates can, can come in very handy. For example, setting up a repository for a new service. If we do that every few months, then it's not worth automating it. But having a template for the repository structure and the most common tooling already integrated, that can be very valuable. And the next team, which uh, can just copy-paste the template and start from there, might thank us. And also, look for existing templates. For example, many frameworks come with a command line interface or a script to bootstrap a new project. That the result might be a bit opinionated and might not fit our exact conventions, but it's often a good starting point. Now, let's zoom out again and have a look at a larger bus space. At some point, 
we are inevitably going to run into scaling issues with this design. All in all, the architecture is just too monolithic and too inflexible. There are certain limits to the width of the bus, and also we will eventually run into obstacles. There are seas and, uh, and lakes uh, that, that just prevent us from scaling indefinitely. Also, the pattern of feeding resources at the top of the, uh, of the bus only works as, we, as long as we have enough of these resources in the area around. At some point, we will run out of resources there, and then we will need to fetch them from farther, further away. So, it's time to change our architecture, and for that, we need a new logistics paradigm. With belts, we have, every, we have to build everything very compact, since belts are expensive, belts are slow, and they are limited in throughput, all favoring a monolithic architecture. The solution that Factorio offers us are railways. These solve virtually all of these problems. Rails are cheap, trains are fast, and they have high capacity. But railways also do have some downsides. Unloading a train requires quite some time, and the stations take up quite a lot of space. So trains are not the silver bullet for any type of uh, logistics. They are a specific tool for long-distance transport. So let's see how this allows us to change our architecture. We can now break up our monolith and create new small spin-off bases. But unlike our main base, these spin-off bases are specialized to do a specific task. This one, for example, mines iron ore and immediately turns it into iron plates before loading it onto a train. And in our main base, we can now replace the former, the, the cluster that formerly did the mining and melting, with a train station. And the train station fetches resources, so in this case iron plates, from the external uh, factory and feeds them into the existing bus. In fact, we don't really need to care where exactly the iron comes from. It could be any of potentially multiple providers. So, we've replaced a part of our monolith with a client that fetches resources from an external entity. That sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? Well, we've just invented microservices. The analogy is actually quite striking. The concept of microservices builds upon common protocols and common formats for long-distance data transfer, usually you have HTTP and JSON, which is kind of the analogy to, to our trains. The marshalling and unmarshalling of uh, domain objects to and from JSON just corresponds to our train loading and unloading stations. And microservices are designed to do a specific task or be in a specific domain, just as our microfactory only produces a single resource. As a result, we generally decrease the complexity of our architecture. It becomes less necessary to have the full overview over the system. Uh, instead, it's possible to work on, a speci on, a specialized, uh, on specialized systems independently. So when growing from one or two teams to multiple teams, this shift allows us breaking up complexity into smaller manageable parts. But this also comes at a price. One downside of this shift is that managing infrastructure becomes more complex and more important. In Factorio, more and more effort goes into planning and maintaining the train network. In software architecture, more and more effort goes into infrastructure and monitoring, 
So you often set up dedicated SRE teams to maintain that infrastructure. So just as we said, trains are not the silver bullet. The same holds for microservice architecture. Just blindly splitting everything into smaller and smaller parts uh, can, can create too much infrastructure overhead. So it's good to put some thought into how small our units really should be and how to slice, slice them in a way that, they're, uh, that, that makes sense. So with that shift to microservices or microfactories, we overcame the inherent expansion limits of the bus architecture. So we were able to scale much easier, but even with this new architectural paradigm, there's still quite a lot of planning and decision-making involved. In order to extend our base, we don't need to refactor as much as before, but it still involves quite a lot of manual steps. We need to look for a good spot where we can build our small independent microfactory. Then we can build the manufacturing cluster from a blueprint, so that's at least automated, but we still need to connect it to the, uh, to the train network, and that involves routing belts and train lines manually. And then we also need to connect the new factory to the existing train network without breaking anything else. All in all, by routing train lines just wherever we need them, we will run into the same problem we had at the very beginning with belts. It will, it will just turn into a huge mess. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just scale? If we could add more factories without having to worry where exactly to build them with the railway connection already built in? And all that in a, in a way that is tidy and doesn't turn into a mess. So, it turns out that in Factorio, there, there is a pretty neat pattern. The first ingredient to that pattern is a predictable grid layout. This layout can be constructed from a single blueprint. It tiles very easily, and trains just move along that grid. The second ingredient is a Factorio mod called the Logistic Train Network. This allows us to mark train stations as sources or sinks for certain products and will automatically dispatch trains wherever they are needed. So very similar to our robot network where robots are dispatched where they are needed. Our plain grid cell looks like this. Effectively, this grid layout allows us to completely decentralize architecture. Instead of planning a new train line, we just add a new cell wherever we, uh, we, wherever we want, wherever there's space, and it just works. Now, let's add some content to those cells. Each grid cell has train stations for, con oops, has, uh, train stations for consuming and producing certain materials or products. For example, that's, uh, uh, that cell here on the left, um, has iron ore coming in at the, at the top, turns it into, uh, or melts it down into iron plates, and then produces them uh, to the train station at the bottom. The right one looks almost exactly the same, but it consumes iron plates and melts them into steel plates. One neat, neat little detail, uh, so Factorio allows also all kinds of circuitry um, I've used that to add monitoring to those cells. As you can see, the input buffer here is starting to run empty, 4 out of 12, uh, whereas the output buffer is almost full, so uh, there should hopefully be a train scheduled pretty soon. Each of these cells is a factory of its own, so it will take some time to design, for example, to get the balancing right, but then once you have it, it can be blueprinted indefinitely. 
And if you build a new and improved version of a cell, then you can just reply, replace the old cells with the new ones. Like these two cells here, both consume iron plates and copper wires in order to produce electronic circuits. But the left one is an older version, whereas the right one is a new and improved and more efficient version of the same cell. So at one point we can just tear down the left one, replace it by the blueprint of the right, and we have a bit more capacity. And if we are running low on a particular item, then we can just add another cell that produces that item. Because of the grid layout, it doesn't matter at all where exactly we deploy that new cell. We can just build it somewhere where there's free, uh, free space. And the result is this very uniform and decentralized grid. The area covered by this grid compared to our bus space is 20 times as large. Now, what are we actually building here? We basically switched to a kind of service-oriented architecture. Our automated train logistic network is basically a bit com comparable to a service mesh. I mean, it's literally a mesh, just uh, if you look at it. Our self-sufficient factories in, in those cells, they kind of have an analogy in containerized microservices. So uh, like Kubernetes pods. But why was this architecture switch essential for us being able to scale? We can scale, we can now scale the individual parts of our base without having to change the overall architecture. Just think how we would have had to resize the bus uh, in order to add more capacity horizontally, to add more capacity vertically, to make space for more, uh, for more factories. Here, adding new factories changes nothing in the overall architecture. Um, so cells can be created, modified, replaced completely independently. If we were to play this in multiplayer, which is actually possible in Factorio, then each person or each team could be responsible for a few types of cells, and there would nobody who, uh, and we would need no one to coordinate the overall layout. This means also that the role of a software architect changes. In a monolithic architecture like our bus space, the, the role of an architect is to oversee that everything is in its place and to decide where exactly to add new stuff or how to refactor so that the overall architecture stays well ordered. So an architect in a monolithic world needs to be very closely involved with every decision a single team makes. In service-oriented architecture, like our factorial grid, the role is very different. Software architects rather are responsible for the overall framework, like the grid itself, but teams can be much more independent in making decisions as long as they are staying within that framework. So within those cells, you can basically do anything you, uh, you want or anything you need. Now, by that point in my factorial game, of course, most of these analogies had already started to dawn on me. So I thought, myself, I thought to myself, why not play around with those analogies and use patterns from software architecture in factorial? We cycled through multiple architectural patterns or paradigms from a monolith to microservices to service-oriented architecture. But we have, what we haven't tried yet is serverless. So when stripping things down to the bare minimum, what do we really need to produce something? We just need a single factory building and uh, some adapter to some logistics network. The most flexible network 
in Factorio that we have are logistic robots. So how would the very minimum production unit look like? Our minimum unit is very, very compact. It would just be a single assembling machine with a few chests for input and output. The logistic robots then just take over the rest. Uh, this minimum grid also looks very scalable and it tiles really well. So what you see here is, uh, okay, here you see those factories, this is the cell, and those buildings around we can just ignore for now, they're just in order to, to, to boost productivity. So just like with our train grid, we can just add new factories wherever we need, uh, but the units are a lot smaller, so we could think we are even more flexible, right? Well, <laughs> here's the lesson that the factorial taught me. It doesn't scale well. The smaller the units, the more, over, the, the more overhead we have per unit. So we run, we run into performance issues much sooner. In, fact, in Factorio, the limit is CPU power, the CPU power for my machine I'm running Factorio on. The smaller the unit, the more overhead we have for scheduling and moving items between those units. Scheduling several thousand robots, each moving just a few individual items, is just way more overhead than scheduling a single train for several, uh, several thousand items at once. So, Factorio usually has 60 game ticks per second, and with, with that architecture, I was soon down to below 10 game ticks. So, the game was still running, but not at a playable speed anymore. And even if you add more CPU, then it just takes a bit longer until you hit, uh, you hit that limit. But on the other hand, uh, this result from Factorio is actually pretty consistent with my real-life experience with serverless architecture. So while serverless is great for scaling small projects from zero, um, we don't really get that benefit on a larger scale. Sure, it scales linearly, but linear scaling can also come with a very bad factor. And usually you want to benefit from scale and you just don't benefit from any scale, from any larger scale with uh, serverless. But there are still places where the serverless architecture can really shine for infrequent, low throughput tasks and tasks that are not time critical. There, the approach really makes sense. And then there's again the uh, analogy in Factorio. There are some products that we don't need on a train load scale. For example, assembling machines themselves. Even to build our huge uh, grid base, we need a few hundred or a few thousand uh, assembling machines all in all, which is small compared to the, a single train load even. Plus, since they will be built by construction robots, it makes sense to directly store them in the robot network. So for producing assembling machines, uh, the serverless pattern actually really makes sense. And similar to a, for, for a, a few other types of buildings, so I have this small cluster of, well, of serverless production within my grid, uh, within my grid architecture. And this is what my software architecture experience taught me about Factorial. Now, let's take a step back and look at what we've learned. So, I just gave you a half hour walk through a game of Factorial. In reality, this was about 150 hours of playing time stretched over two months. But the development we saw somewhat resembles the growth and change of a software project over several years. This brings me to my key takeaway. As a software project evolves and grows, so does its architecture, 
and so do also the best practices we follow. In a small project with just one or two teams, probably on the green field, possibly with pressure to ship anything at all, we have different focus and uh, will follow different best practices than with a mature project, hundreds of developers, probably fighting with some amount of legacy code and pressure to make existing customers happy. In a lot of cases, there is no simple A is better than B, but the question is, what's the situation you're in? What are your challenges right now? For example, there are a lot of opinions around whether mono repositories are better than multiple dedicated repositories or vice versa. But looking at our time component, my answer is it depends. Are you just starting a project with one or two teams? Then you probably want a mono repository. It fosters collaboration and exchange, which greatly can help focusing on the few features that make up a minimum viable product. But when you, have, when you have 20 teams to juggle, each with their own domain and own re responsibility, then you want, you need to minimize the synchronization overhead between those teams. So you will probably want rather strong separation of concerns and therefore probably separate re repositories. And similar arguments go for monolithic versus microservices, micro frontends, and the like. Now, this marks the end of my talk. Thank you all for listening. I hope you found this talk both entertaining and instructive, just as I found playing Factorio entertaining and ins instructive. And I think we have uh, three minutes left Ooh, for questions, so thank you. Thank you. Good way to expense playing time, right? <laughs> Do we have any questions? We have a, a few minutes left. Um, I, I think I can speak like this. Is there any concept of cost in the game? Because real factories have costs. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so costs are always measured in in terms of uh, resources needed and uh, also time that is needed to build. Uh, so I, I showed you before the, the, uh, what you need to build a green circuit, the, the electronic circuit, and that the, the composite cost of that is just uh, measured in iron ore that goes into the iron plates. Um, the, uh, and of course, fuel that goes into uh, into producing those iron plates and so on. Then there's also energy consumption, which which we haven't touched at all here. Um, but yeah, so so you don't have uh, you don't have monetary cost, but you do have um, uh, you do have uh, time consumption and resource consumption in order to produce anything. One more question. Uh, do resource fields get exhausted if you do yeah. them well? Yeah. They, they get depleted and that is also one, one of the things why you, at some point you need to, to, uh, to branch out using, using trains. So you, you're actually forced to go towards that micro factory approach because at some point the resources are just depleted where you, all the resources in the vicinity are depleted. Thank you again.